think Oxford started it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, can I welcome all members and officers to this meeting of the Standards Committee, which will be held as a remote meeting via Microsoft Teams. It's being recorded and will be available via the Council's website to be viewed as soon as practically possible following the meeting. Everyone participating in this meeting will be accessing the meeting from remote locations. Please could everyone ensure that mobile phones are switched off to silent mode. Yeah. Members will have received an electronic copy of the agenda. I will ask officers to present a summary of the key points. For the record, the agenda can be viewed on the Council's website. Members and officers will be speaking at various points during the meeting, and those speaking may switch their microphones on at that point. But I would ask that with the exception of myself as chair, at all other times you keep your microphone switched off, as this will help to minimise any background noise and interference, and to ensure the connection remains as stable as possible. All members are asked to keep their cameras on throughout the meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. If any members or officers wish to raise, raise a point or question, they should press the hands up icon on the top right hand side of Microsoft Teams window, and I'll come to you in the order I receive requests. Please lower your hand once you have finished speaking. The chat button has been disabled for this meeting. Please do not use your microphone until I invite you to do so. Officers from the Democratic Services will be supporting the meeting and will be monitoring the use of microphones throughout the meeting. And where necessary, we'll mute those not being used. I would ask the officers to introduce themselves and as, as and when I invite them to speak during the course of the meeting. They too should ensure microphones switched off or not in use, please. I will now proceed to the agenda business. Apologies. Are there any apologies for absence? No, Chair, everybody's here today. Switching my own phone off. Thank you very much. Um, are there any, uh, moving on, are there any declarations of interest? Uh, let's see, Amanda Williams. Thank you very much, Councillor Amanda Williams here. I need to, I'm here for the first report and I need to clear a personal interest that I am married to Councillor Martin Williams. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, Councillor Martin Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the converse of that, uh, I declare just in item three, as I am I'm married to Group Leader of the County, Pretend County Independent. Thank you very much, Councillor Williams. Ch Chair, if I can just check that point, Councillor Williams, Martin Williams, that's a prejudicial interest, I take it, is it? No, no, don't take it like that. It's a personal interest. Wait, funny. Rob, can you um, put your phone microphone on? Rob Lynch, can you put your microphone on mute, please? And Philip. Thank you very much. Um, so just got confirmation of those uh, declarations of interest. Thank you very much. Are there any others? I don't see any other hands going up. So we will move on to item three, standards of conduct. Oh, I'm still on that chair speech, bear with me. Um, this is a report to, um, with, we've obviously had the reports of the three political group leaders of the council. Ellie, do you want to talk this through or? You want to through yes, that? Chair, just, just very briefly. Um, so the purpose of the report is to prevent, uh, present to, to the members of the Standards Committee the reports we've received from the three political group leaders, um, which outlines their compliance with the duties in relation to standards of conduct. Um, this is a new duty that's come in under uh, the uh, Local Government and Election Wales Act 2021, and this is the second time the group leaders have been invited to speak to you. Um, at the annual meeting in May 2024, um, myself as the proper officer, I was informed in writing of the following political groups and the leaders. 
So we have the Labour group, uh, who the group leader is Councillor John Spanswick. We have the Bridgen County Independents and the group leader is Councillor Amanda Williams. And we have the Democratic Alliance group, group leader, uh, Councillor Ross Penhill thomas um, They have submitted uh, a report, which is attached to Appendix 1 to 3. And obviously they're in attendance today to take any questions um, or views from the committee um, and to, to feed back to you how they think that the, the conduct has been over the last 12 months. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kelly. Um, we will take them in the order that they are on the report. So um, I'll come to Councillor Spanswick first just for any comments he wishes to make on the report, and then we'll come for questions specifically on that. Okay, thank you, Chair. And as I'm relatively new to the group leader position, it's me, but uh, I've been a county better councillor since 1992, so 32 years. And I can honestly say that I've tried my best personally to withhold the best uh, standards of conduct, but also ensuring anybody I work with within a Labour group act in the same way. And over the last year, that's continued, even though I hasn't been a working leader, the previous leader, David, has carried on uh, previously with that. We do have a, a, a group whip system in place, and contrary to what some people may may assume, it's not there to tell you how to vote. It's there to monitor, uh, help advise, help the well-being of, of members, their training of members, their conduct, and to have that sort of pastoral care of members, but to make sure the standards are maintained to the highest possible at all times in public life. Um, I'm quite happy that we're doing our best of that. I'll continue to make sure that all members at all times in my group uh, conduct themselves in the, the, the standards in public life. Well, thank you for that, Councillor Spanswick. I'll open to any questions that the um, panel wants to make uh, to Councillor Spanswick. Raise your hand if you have any queries. Thank you, Roy. Uh, morning, Councillor uh, Spanswick. Um, uh, I read through the report. And you just you stated that your deputy was meeting with or were meeting with the non-executive members um, yeah. regarding reviews. Can you tell me what sort of progress has been made on that, please? Yeah, they've started. Um, I know she was doing some yesterday. So myself, I'm going through doing uh, appraisals and personal development plans with the cabinet members and the deputy uh, as a date set in a calendar, they've already started going through into the next month, into August, to try and get all these completed uh, by September. So we'll then have a, a plan for the whole group as far as their training needs, their development needs, uh, and any personal issues they may have that we cover all these off. So by the by September, that'll be the whole group will have their personal development plan in place. OK, that's uh, just a supplementary question. And, and it's to all the group leaders, all three. Um, I'm just wondering if if there's a common approach that you could all take towards reviewing your members' um, training needs and their, their sort of conduct. Um, is there some sort of um, manage, uh, performance management um, system that you could implement that is common across all political parties? So there's I suppose, transparency in the common approach. Thank you. OK, thank you, Roy. I'll come to Councillor Amanda Williams first. Thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, Rachel Keepins is um, the Democratic Services Manager who has been liaising with all group leaders and it's a requirement for all of us to carry out these reviews, meet with individuals, in my group, there are a few of us. There's myself, there's Councillor Martin Williams and Councillor Anthony Barrow and Councillor Freya Bledsoe who are meeting and pairing with others in the group so that we can go through their training needs and um, also anything else that we deem necessary, such as conduct and everything. And then they report back to myself and I complete those reports. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, uh, sorry, Gavin Thomas uh, next, please. I, I, I guess so a, a, a question to Councillor Sponzer, but I guess it's appropriate to all three of all three of the, the leaders really is. Um, if you look at the standards committee's um, role over the last sort of 12 to 18 months, it's increasingly, well, 
I say increasingly, it's social media based um, complaints and social media based um, breaches of the of the code. So um, what can the party leads do to try and um, either uh, increase the standards or increase the awareness of social of the code of conduct in relation to social media because i think if we can if we can try and help councillors with the the social media approach we can reduce the amount of complaints that we get to both the ombudsman and to the standards committee so thank you thank you gavin uh, before we come back to answering that question i'm going to come to uh, Ross thomas just to answer the previous question about um because i know you had your hand up so it didn't come to you about how you're Supporting or um, looking at your members gen more generally. Yeah, the Dioch chair. Yeah, just in response to Rob's question, uh, it's something of a more informal approach in in my group in in terms of uh, following the AGM. Um, if there is to be uh, some exchanges in committees, for example. Um, members will be asked relatively informally um, if they have any training needs. Uh, clearly, if they're on some of the statutory committees, such as licensing or uh, development control, um, that would require um, absolutely some some training. Um, I have a mix of um, some long-standing members and some newer members, so the training me needs are quite mixed as well. But we uh, we keep in regular contact with Democratic Services just to check that uh, that members are. All, are very much in keeping with the training that they absolutely mandatorily need um, as statutory, but um, equally members are encouraged to to attend all training sessions where possible. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Um, so in response, I believe, to the question about social media, um, I'll come to Councillor Spanswick. Thank you, Chair. In, in relation to social media, as far as possible, well, I advise and encourage all members not to engage in the majority of social media unfortunately because it's negative and personal and it doesn't achieve anything and the, the public do not want to see negative uh, arguments between different political groups um, so the, and this constant uh, negative uh, social media posts from a certain group which I won't say any more than that but so I try my best for all, all group members to avoid from engaging with it because it just does not achieve anything. Thank you, Councillor Bandwick. Uh, Councillor Williams. I think leading on from Councillor Spanswick, that's the big issue for us is I know he was referring about my group um, with the social media posts. And I think this is where our relationship is maybe fractured. And I put in my report that we haven't worked together yet. So I don't know how this is going to um, because he's newly elected to the position of group leader how this is going to play out in the future. Um, I think it's very difficult when you're putting a political post out. If you're an opposition member, you're going to be a bit pointy with your politics. And I think that's where <clears throat> maybe people will disagree with, the, with what you're saying on social media. However, that is politics. You see it from every party, whether you're independent, Labour, Conservative, Lib Dem, and that's the element. What I see from social media is pretty horrific sometimes. I've been targeted in the last 10 months. I've had my car tyres slashed. I've had my CCTV camera cables cut. I've had my security lighting smashed. I have one individual who is constantly saying I'm bullying her on social media. And yet I've never met her or been in any contact with her, claiming she's looking through my window. And I have three children, so it's extremely alarming. And I think this is the sort of thing on social media that as group leaders, we're powerless to get involved with, particularly because it's not members of our groups. These are supporters of the, the politics. So it could be somebody who supports independent or somebody who supports Labour. And so as group leaders, we're powerless to stop that. We've rep I've reported all of these inst instances to the police and I don't get any support from the police. I haven't had any support from BCBC myself with regards to what I've had to deal with in the last 10 months, having to tell my children to watch their backs when they're going out, having a 17-year-old who's scared to stay at home in the daytime on his own. And it is really getting out of control. And I think the whole attack in then just gets really bad. I've got, I've got one member there are screenshots of a WhatsApp chat trying to push them over the edge so they kill themselves. I mean, this is unacceptable behaviour. 
And I think a lot of this also stems from um, community councillors. And I put in my report that the worst behaviour involves town and community councillors who are volunteers and they are being targeted to push them for whatever reason um, to, to the brink. And I think we need to resolve this. And I think until this is all resolved, but with social media, you can't stop people from saying what they want and doing what they want. They hide behind so many fake profiles. Um, I'm just worried and I just really am concerned about where it's going to go in future. But as I say, as group leaders, 99.90% of the time, we're powerless to do anything because it doesn't involve any of us councillors. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, John Fang, you've still got your hand up, so if you could lower your hand first off, Councillor Spanswick, and I'll come to Ross um, Thomas for uh, Councillor Thomas for uh, any comment. Uh, dear Chair, yeah, not surprised at all to see um, social media and the question posed around social media. Um, myself, um, I've been a prolific user of social media, in particular Facebook, in my councillor role for the last six or seven years. I'm pleased to say that I'm generally unscathed. Uh, public affairs and public relations is my work life anyway. Um, as I've mentioned already, um, half of my members are returning members. Um, the other half are relatively new members. Some of them are on social media, some of them are not. Um, it's a case really of, uh, as, certainly as group leader, I, I glance an eye on some of their pages every now and again just to ensure that the conversation and any, any postings are and in keeping with the code of conduct. Um, it's really easy to be goaded on social media, really, really easy. The guidance from the local authority is, is quite clear, but um, and it can be so difficult at times not to engage, to try and not to engage in it, especially if it becomes personal. Um, luckily, I mean, I, I've managed to escape unscathed. Um, and fingers crossed, hopefully, um, you know, nothing's going to happen anytime soon. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really difficult one. Social media really does have the power to get a message across to people that otherwise wouldn't see that message. And that's why primarily it's used. But unfortunately, there are, there are actors in this arena who don't use it for those purposes and use it for uh, entirely different purposes, I would say, Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. I'll come back to Gavin Thomas, who asked the question. Yeah, sorry, I think, yeah, I just wanted to be, be clear on my question, really, I guess, is uh, I 100% I, I appreciate Councillor Williams' comments about the misuse of social media and things. Um, my, my view and the, and the phrase of the question, I guess, was around how, as leaders of groups, can we manage the actual councillor's posts? Because from a standards committee, our remit is obviously looking at the code of conduct and councillor's behaviours. And if you look at the hearings that the councillor's had, other sorry, the standards committee has had over the last couple of months and years, it's really um, social media has played a big part in that. So what what does leaders of the group? So I think councillor Ross Thomas just touched upon um, checking potentially um, uh, dropping in on people's. Uh, Facebook pages to see the the tone of conversations, but I'm just curious as to what the leaders think um, we we could potentially do to educate uh, councillors on social media and and uh, Facebook social social media and code of conduct issues. Sorry, did that make more sense? Sorry, but... I think it did. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. So it is more about the role of the current councillors and um, overseeing the use of social media. As Councillor Williams has said, Councillor Amanda Williams has said, there is some horrific stuff on social media that is uncontrollable by yourselves, but there is some sense of ownership by the um, groups take a lead um, on some of the other areas. So I'll come back to uh, Councillor um, Thomas and Penhill Thomas. The yeah, Chair, uh, yeah, just uh, in um, in addition to, to, to just glancing over um, my group members' Facebook pages, that, that you know there have been a couple of instant instances where uh, the monitoring officer has had to be contacted um, simply for advice, where perhaps a post by um, a member has been misconstrued, that advice has been passed on to that member, and that post has been removed immediately. So um, I think there's that sort of dialogue, regular dialogue with the monitoring officer, in particular about content of posts posts that could be misconstrued and uh, there was nothing sort of illegal in the post it was a, a miscon a misconstruence if that's a word <laughs> thanks chair thank you councillor thomas that's amanda williams 
Thank you very much. Yes, the same as Councillor Ross Thomas. Um, if there's anything of concern, the legal officer will give advice and either suggest it's changed, the wording is changed, or will say, no, that's fine, that's political. Um, I'm not in a lot of the hubs because of the nastiness that's on social media. I don't want to face that and see some of it. So I'm only in the hubs that really relate to my ward. But I will access them. And if I think myself that something is inappropriate, then I will ask whoever has posted it to remove it. Um, but obviously, as I said, we don't have any remit outside of our group. Unfortunately, I think the public as well see, and it will be the same for Labour as well as independents, they'll see somebody who is a Labour member or a supporter of the independents who puts a comment, but we cannot then ask them to remove it, even if they're in the Labour Party. Um, independence is more difficult because as independence, you can say or virtually do what you want, but we can report it and put it. And I do. I did previously speak to Hugh if I found something that might spark something. But I do tell my group it doesn't always happen, but I do tell them to stay away and not to engage. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, as a, a Labour group, the one thing we are in the process of doing is, is arranging training on social media, um, and that'll be a regular ongoing thing each year to make sure up to date training. Um, but myself, the deputy leader, and the whips team, which are three people, um, regularly monitor how it's on any part of Facebook they're on to see what's on there, and if there's things inappropriate, that's dealt with straight away, and the, the person told to remove. Um, that, but the rare occasions, because I would hope the majority are not engaging, not putting negative comments or inappropriate comments on social media, and that comes down to training as well. Um, but and I also think each group leader must be held responsible for pages that are posted in the name of that group, and that goes to the Labour group, um, independent, and there is a Jane County Independence page, which the leader must be held responsible for. I disagree with that and I would be happy to ask for independent legal advice on that because Bridgend County Independence covers a lot of independents who are community councillors. I have no remit over any of them so I cannot be held accountable for a group like that. The same way if if Welsh Labour put out a post, it's not Councillor Spanswick's responsibility for that either. It's them. So I cannot be held responsible for a for group posts. If I think there's something in there that I don't think is appropriate, I will get it removed. But I cannot be held responsible for that. And it is not my responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, I think just uh, as a, a note, um, I recently attended the um, All Wales Chairs Forum of Standards Committees, uh, where we had a, a few presentations, and the issue of social media did come up. And it is, it's you know, it's an issue in Bridgend, it's an issue across virtually every local authority across Wales. Um, I think it is carrying on doing that that push of um, taking control of what we can control, educating people both internally in the party. And also some wider messages about standards of councillors and what we expect. But I appreciate some of that cannot come down personally to you, but everyone has a role to play, regardless of political allegiance, in trying to sort of make sure politics is seen to be open, welcoming, and not in the tone that we have obviously seen quite a lot of over the last 12 months. If there's any other comments on social media, I'll take them now. If not, I'd started with John Sp uh, Councillor Spanswick uh, making a comment about his report. I will move on to the next, unless there's any other questions relating specifically to social media. Roy? Uh, it's not specifically about social media. Um, I'm sort of go, go away from that issue at the moment. It's just about um, trying to promote standards. I mean, as group leaders, all three group leaders and as the standards committee, we have a, a duty to promote uh, standards. So I'm, I'm just proposing an idea um, to all group leaders. Um, currently, I, do you open up your meetings with a reminder regarding standards of contact uh, conduct? And if not, 
um, would you consider uh, at the start of each meeting as an agenda item um, producing or creating an introductory statement to reinforce the sort of, sort of Nolan uh, principles, i.e. the code of conduct, i.e. sort of treat each other with respect, at least uh, listen to each other's uh, uh, opinion. And like I said, the, the introductory statement could become uh, an agenda item for all for all uh, committee uh, meetings. Um, I'm only putting forward is is on that principle of a nudge pr uh, principle that if you uh, keep on reinforcing a statement time after time after time, it become no uh, become normalised. So I'm just wondering, to all th uh, three group leaders, would you consider producing? A introductory statement on reinforcing the principles of good conduct at each meeting. Can I have your thoughts, please? Thank you, Roy. I'll come to Councillor Amanda Williams. Thank you very much. It's something that I do raise continuously with my group. We have a group leaders meeting, a monthly group leaders meeting. We do discuss it now and then, but I maybe going forward, we also include that as a standing agenda mm -hmm. in our group meet in our group leader meetings. So I would suggest that to Councillor John Spanswick, who chairs those meetings, um, as to maybe we and Kelly as to whether we can include it going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Amanda Williams, Councillor Spanswick. Yes, thanks for that. And, and I totally agree with Councillor Manny Williams there that the group leader meetings, yes, let's put a standard item on there. It, it can't, has been and can be discussed anyway, but if it's a standard agenda item on there, um, and while again the group meetings, myself and the other group meetings, it's discussed and make sure again that it's a standard item on there. So every monthly meeting, um, code of conduct for standards will be an item on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Thomas. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, like colleagues, more than happy to take that away for consideration. Uh, can I just apologise to Roy? I, I need my glasses on, Roy. I think I called you Rob earlier. My apologies. <laughs> <No problem>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Captain Thomas. OK, um, as I said, I um, had the a statement from Councillor Spanswick from uh, the Labour group. Um, I don't know who's next on the list of the agenda. I was taking it, so... Oh. my notes. Um, I'll go to Councillor Williams, Amanda Williams, um, for any statements or any comments you want to make on your report. Thank you very much. I've made most of them. I think the only two issues are around training, and we've struggled a bit with the training. You'll see from my that. report. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry Roy Lynch, could you please put yourself on mute again? Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Williams. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to discuss was the training element. Now, I do have regular updates as to who's been on what training, and I do share that with my group to ask that they go on the training, the compulsory training. There are a couple of issues. I've sat through all of the online training, and I've also been to the in-person training, and there is a lot of duplicate training. And I think particularly if you're a working member as well, it's very difficult to be able to do both, particularly when you're repeating yourself. So I, I do believe that something needs to be looked at there because some of it is a duplication. Um, and I've sat I've sat the same training now over the last few months and I've sat it in person and online. So I think. To get more people engaged, I think we need to look at the training program to ensure that there is no duplication, because then that might also free up some opportunity for some further training that's not currently provided. Um, so I do think that sometimes that doesn't get members buy in if they think, well, I've got to do that. I've just done that in person and it is identical because I've checked it's identical because I've been on them both. The other issue I've got is I've got one member who has got eyesight problems and has been asked to do the compulsory online training, but they're not in an accessible format. So they are unable to do that at the moment. And we haven't had an update on how they will get around that because they're still told they have to do the online training even when they've attended the in-person training. So I think that needs to be looked at too, to ensure that everyone is accessible for all 
and that everyone is attending those training sessions. Thank you. Um, I'll come to Kelly uh, for a response. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, more than happy to take a, a further report to Democratic Services Committee. As you know, they do have regular reports on training um, and they sort of set the agenda for training. So I'm happy to, to pick that up with your, your fellow colleagues in, in Democratic Services Committee. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, um, anything else to add to that, uh, Councillor Williams? Your no, I raised the concerns about the social media, I think, previously when we were asked the question and how I, how I find it's more and more difficult. And I think the stress on, on us who are here to do the best for our communities um, is, is, uh, is it's concern the way it's going. Um, you know, I don't feel safe anymore. I don't feel supported. And... It's very difficult when you're a group of independents. People wonder why you're a group of independents. We're called all, always a party online. We're a group of a, a support network because we need support. Because standing out there on your own, you're not going to get any support. And that's what we are. And I think it works well. But I am concerned with the way things are going. I've got individuals who have come to me. And whilst I have no remit over town and community councillors, they come to me for advice and support and say somebody's contacted my employer putting a complaint in about me it's getting quite nasty out there and I think as BC BC councillors we're all and you know it there is more of a structure but I think town and community councillors I think something some more work needs to be done there because essentially they're volunteers and I think more work needs to be done because I think that's where the majority of the complaints are coming from as well and I think there needs to be more of a support network and more structure because all of my group are town or community councillors as well so we see it from both sides so I think as a committee I would suggest you look at that element if you're looking at reducing complaints as well thank you thank you Councillor Amanda Williams uh, I'll just respond to that before I come to Gavin Thomas so um, over the past 12 months, uh, we have uh, begun a, a sort of an approach of uh, members attending various community councils. Um, I've personally attended one, and I know a couple of other individuals have, just sort of for that observation point of view, just to see how they run. And I'm sure during those, we'll pick up the intelligence of areas that might need support. Um, I think going back to the comment about um, opening meetings with that sort of code of conduct, social media approach that um, Roy suggested it might be something else members if we are visiting those councils we reiterate some of those messages in our reason for visiting not saying there's issues with those community council make it very clear but just that holistic approach um, and that it's you know we're, we're there to support people um, but we wanted to make sure that standards are maintained um, so that's something that the committee are already committed to and we're sure we'll pick up again and uh, continue that process um, I'll come to Gavin Thomas. I'm not sure this is a question to um, the group. Thank you, Chair. I guess it's just two points to make. One is just picking up on one point that Councillor Williams made. Um, how do we, maybe it's a question for, for the monitoring officer, how do we make sure that the, the code of conduct training and the, the, the standards training is inclusive for everybody? So you've mentioned somebody with maybe sight or, or human difficulties. I think we just need to be clear that the standards and the code of conduct is an essential part of a councillor's uh, toolbox. So um, I'm not sure how we would. Maybe that's a recommendation from a standards committee that we that we get some report on how the how the um, the training is accessible. So I let I let the, the modern officer on sound. I've got a second question then for the leaders, if I can. Okay, we we'll come to Kelly first to respond to that one before coming back. Thank you, Chair. Um, I always offer the, the code of conduct and the standards training in person. Um, obviously, we can address any accessibility issues then. I've done it using the hearing loop. Um, I've done it by printing out larger copies of the documentation when requested. We, we haven't had any concerns with, with the um, standards committee training, with the conduct, code of conduct training. Nobody's made a request that we haven't been able to comply with. Um, happy to look at it if there is anything in the future. Um, but most people come to me directly and we find a way to, to deal with it appropriately. 
I'll come back to, I'm going to go slightly out of order and go to Councillor Williams, but I think she's directly responding to that statement by Kenny. Is that okay? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, yeah, so all of my group have completed their code of conduct training and that was done in person. Thank you. Um, there are some, some other compulsory training courses that need to be completed in qualities and some others like that. And those are the ones I've done them online. They are very difficult because you're looking for a little question mark and you're pressing the hovering your your mouse over it to reveal the answers and things so it is very difficult then so it's those extra additional training courses that i don't think are accessible um but are equally as important because obviously equalities and things like that are things that you need to be making sure you're complying with as well to ensure that you are complying with the code of conduct thank you Thank you for that clarification. I think hopefully Kelly will pick that up with the report that she referred to. So I'll come back to Gavin Thomas. Uh, I think you have a question for the group leaders. Yeah, thank you. So I get it's picking up uh, on Councillor Williams's point about town and community councils, and I fully agree that the, a lot of the complaints stance committee get um, referred are from town and community councillors rather than Bower, Bower Council members. And uh, my question, I guess, would be to the group leaders is, um, is there anything you think the standards committee should be doing to try and um, influence behaviours? So, uh, as the chair has said, we, we are attending council uh, meetings, etc. But is there anything particular you think that you'd like us to to take on? Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Um, so, Councillor Williams, Amanda Williams first. I think for me, the concern is that each town and community council. Has will have a different clerk. Some share clerks. There are, you know, some common clerks. Some are newly appointed. Some haven't got clerks, or they struggle to maintain them. So I think the first port of call is looking at the quality of the clerks and the training that they receive. So we're fortunate in BCBC. We have Kelly and Laura. So we have someone to go to for guidance. And so we all know in our groups we are following that one rule. Whereas it's more difficult when you've got all the town and community councils because you've got individuals who might be doing something differently to another one. And I, I mean, I'm, on a chair, I'm a chair of governors and I'm on another governors and it's the same with the clerks there. Once you've got more people ag agreeing the rules or giving their version of the rules, I think that's where you're going to struggle potentially as well to make sure everyone understands those rules. So I think my first port of call for, for you would be to look at the training needs and maybe whether they could buddy up if they're new clerks with long term existing clerks for support. Um, because I think if you've got a strong clerk, then they should be able to manage the the the, the meetings a lot better and it might reduce the the concerns with regards to code of conduct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Amanda Williams and thank you, Councillor Stanswick. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, similar to Councillor Mandy Williams, it's difficult. Town and community council level, there isn't a sort of a, a group structure, uh, perhaps as the same as a, a county borough level. Uh, but I'm wondering, I mean, they all have to and should be attending code of conduct training, and the clerks have their own training and support through One Voice Wales and other bodies. But I'm not sure, I'm wondering through the remit of the standards committee, similar to group leaders you're providing a report, it's not quite the same with town and community council level, but I'm wondering if there's scope for clerks of community council to do an annual report to a standards committee to give their view from an independent clerk point of view um, as to what, how that they feel that council has operated in the past year. It might not be appropriate, but there does need to be some level of um, responsibility then within town and community councils to comply with the code of conduct and all the principles. Thank you, Councillor Stanswick. Um, I'll carry on on the order, so we'll come to Councillor Thomas. Yes, Chair. Um, I'm not entirely sure that uh, there is the awareness in the Town and Community Council sector, certainly in Wales, of the level and the number of complaints that standards committees are dealing with. And I genuinely believe that if, if you were to write as a standards committee, perhaps um, annually, um, that members of town and community councils would be shocked to realise the number of complaints that you are dealing with. Um, clearly, we, we know as borough members, we receive 
uh, documentation from this committee uh, and you pick things up um, just just generally speaking anyway um uh, i'm a member of a community council have been for almost two decades we've just recently ratified um, a local resolution policy um, and we hope that that will help but i'm sure other community councils have uh, have similar versions uh, and I, I think we're in regular communication with the monitoring officer as well but I do genuinely believe that the scale of the problem isn't necessarily recognised at town and community council level. Like I said, um, 17 years as a member, it didn't used to be like this. It, it hasn't always been like this. Something has gone particularly all right in the last five, six, seven, eight years, whereby the number of complaints coming from community councils has rocketed. Uh, and it's usually member versus member as opposed to much else. And I know there are other complaints, but um, I, I honestly think it would be worth perhaps you chair together with the standards committee, just writing out annually, perhaps ahead of or after the uh, the community council's AGM, just reminding them of code of conduct, reminding of the number of complaints that you have dealt with, um, uh, with, with guidance from the monitoring officer, um, that there's in many cases there's no need um, and the ombudsman often uh, throws out lots of cases as well because they haven't met the threshold but there's a lot of time there's a lot of energy expended in complaining about other members and imagine just just imagine if we put that amount of energy into the work of the council it's um yeah it, it, it would be um a bit different thanks chair thank you thanks thomas thanks walter walter yeah, thanks, Chair. I've just been really trying to collate my thoughts having listened to the discussion, which has focused quite heavily around town and community councils for all the reasons we understand. Um, and, you know, this report is a group leaders report, which I guess by definition it means BCBC group leaders. And I've listened carefully to what Councillor Williams, Amanda Williams has said about, you know, the, if you like, limitations of responsibility. And I, and I understand what she's saying. But I, I just wonder whether uh, perhaps Councillor Spanswick and Councillor Ross Thomas also feel that the limits of their group leader roles um, stay within BCBC or whether they see them as further afield and covering elected members on town and community councils. I think that might be helpful. Thanks. Okay, we'll return to that in question in a minute. Um, uh, Kelly was going to come in. I think it might be on an earlier point. Thank you, Chair. It, well, it was on the, the earlier point of whether we could ask um, town clerks to do a similar report to the group leaders. We can, of course, ask them. Um, it's not included in the legislation. Um, obviously, there is a sp specific duty on the group leaders that isn't on the clerks. So we can ask them, but it will be, you know, at their own discretion whether they want to um, submit something or not. But I'm happy to make those those contacts and see if the the councils would like to to submit something on an annual basis. And as Councillor Thomas said, I can contact them annually just to give them an, an overview of the types of cases that have been coming through um, in the twelve months preceding. Thank you, thank you, Penny. Um, and I think to to round off the other question, then we'll return to Councillor Walters' comments and question to the other two group leaders and keep track. Uh, Councillor Williams, Councillor Martin Williams, sorry. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, just a, a question to the, to the group leaders, and, and, and it's really just a view. We talk about the conduct of members in respect of you know, their conduct and, and, and the complaints that may be made against them. But, and, and it touches on something that Councillor Thomas said about things weren't like this 20 years ago. Do you get a sense that the Code of Conduct and the Ombudsman uh, Complaint Service or the complaint mechanism is being weaponized? Uh, politically, because that is a concern that I had uh, and I expressed when I first came on this committee. And, you know, particularly if you're in a town and community council setting, and, you know, some things are very obviously poor behaviour, and I know, and, 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 and it's, it's almost like an open and shut case. But sometimes, particularly with declarations of interest, that you can get very grey areas. And, and if you if you throw enough complaints in, you will get your, you will get your scalp eventually. So is there a sense and I'd be interested, you know, just to your view that that um, uh, perhaps what's driving what Councillor Thomas said is actually a weaponization of, of this. And if that's the case, what can we do to stop that? OK, thank you, Councillor Williams. So firstly, we're going to go, I believe uh, Councillor Thomas will probably hopefully responding to the question about that kind of responsibility for town councillors. Is that when you're going to come in or is it something else? 
just trying to keep track of loads of yeah, it, 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 Thank, thanks, Jeff. I can respond directly to Councillor Walter. Um, I have no group per se outside of the Chamber of Bridgen County Borough Council. Uh, that said, I do have um, two County Borough members who sit alongside me on my State Town Council. So in that respect, absolutely, um, it would be a case of taking them under my wing and, and I would feel responsible perhaps for, for any um, uh, 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 any code of conduct issues there. Um, equally, although less, uh, uh, well, so less so, not equally, e uh, less so, um, if there are other members of my group who are town and community councillors in, in other parts of the county borough, if there were to be something or of a code of conduct issue that would reflect on their county borough member position, then obviously I would have an interest in uh, supporting them and, and helping resolve that. So um, I, I hope that gives you some clarity on that. Thanks. Thank you, yes. Before I move on, did you have any comments against Councillor Martin Williams thing about weaponisation? If you don't, that's fine, I'll move on, but I don't want to. I, I, all I would say, Chair, is it difficult for me. I've um, I've never been the subject of a complaint to the the Ombudsman, so it, it dif uh, I'm, I'm sorry, difficult for me to comment on, on that, really. Sorry. Thank you. I'll take um, Councillor Spanswick. There's two questions in terms of the responsibility for town councillors and then also the weaponisation to the statement. So, do you really want to respond to both? Okay, thanks, Chair. Yeah, the first one, I'm officially first to myself an appointed leader of the Labour Group of Virginia County Borough, but it doesn't stop there. It extends basically, whether it's informally or, or formally, that uh, I'll try to help and advise and assist with any of the members on any of the town and community councils across the county borough. And quite a few of them are county borough councils as, as well, but quite a lot few are not. Um, and they they know where to come for advice uh, should there be any issues coming up, but we again expect the same standards of them. I just wish there was a better structure in place across Wales for uh, town and community councils as far as who conduct goes, and that's where it goes into the. I would not agree with Councillor Martin Williams's word as weaponising the ombudsman. I think it's definitely a boost to the system. Um, I've been subject of several complaints over the years. I can honestly say every time there's been. Uh, for sake of another word, lies basically submitted about myself, which has been kicked out. Uh, and it's disappointing that people go to that then sometimes to use the ombudsman to try to, uh, on a political basis then, um, which is not, not good. And it's not good for the public standards. It's not good for what the public see in the street either. Thank you, Councillor Spanswick. Uh, Councillor Amanda Williams on both those points. Want to respond on one or both? Yeah, I want to respond first of all on our remit. I think maybe the standards committee should have the copy of the training that we had from Laura Griffiths that confirms we have no remit in community councils or town and community councils but where there's a grey area where it does involve some of our members who sit there and their reputation by virtue would bring the reputation of the counts of BCBC into disrepute so we do have some sort of um, involvement there. But I think for the question, it might be worthwhile you see in the advice we were given from Laura when we had the training as to what we are and aren't responsible for. Um, that being said, I, I am approachable for anyone for advice. Um, if they want support or advice, I will speak to anyone, whether it be an independent or anyone wanting some advice and on the second question, I think the makeup of community councils and town councils has changed as is politics. There are so many groups now, as we saw in the recent election, there's so many more groups coming into, into being. And, you know, there is far, far right, far left and the extremes in it. And I think politics does play a part in that, unfortunately, when the, um, the purpose of a town or community council is what it says on the tin it's for the town or for the community and the politics shouldn't be involved there it should be just working together for the benefit of the community um as a community as with my community council hat on we have a fantastic community council we don't see complaints coming through there we all work well together i wasn't on i'm new in 2020 to the community council but I know the makeup before was different political groups and they still worked well together so it can happen but I do agree that there is no structure there there is nobody accountable so basically each councillor in a town or community council setting can you know are there and standing 
in effect on their own. So I, I would agree that we do need to look at some potential better structure there. Otherwise, we'll continue to have these complaints coming through. Thank you. And uh, no direct response to the second question from Councillor Williams. You'll wrap that up. Well, that was that was it. Yeah, it was that's all fine. about thank you. yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, um, so we just move on to <laughs> Councillor Thomas and his group. If there's any um, comment you want to make about your report. Yeah, Diarco Macabre, thanks for the opportunity, uh, Chair. I've been a member for 13 years, a group leader for seven. Um, we are a group of eight, three of us stood on the same platform, five joined the group uh, on the basis of uh, wanting the best for their communities uh, and coming together, like Amanda Williams said, really, in terms of that support uh, network. I'm um, very pleased, Chair, to um, to report that my um, my submission to the committee today is quite boring, um, bland and beige. Um, no complaints um, uh, across the year. 100% um, of my group have committed, um, uh, completed uh, code of conduct training. Um, I've openly admitted that there needs to be a further push on e-learning modules, and I've been in touch with Laura and Kelly about that in the last couple of weeks. So that's um, that's in action uh, at the moment. Um, members of my group, um, according to their commitments, um, try to attend as many training sessions as possible. I mentioned one member is new to the Development Control Committee, so he's just awaiting um, uh, uh, an agreeable date for that. Um, as mentioned previously as well, a very good relationship with the monitoring officer. I've been here a fairly long time. Uh, Kelly and I know each other pretty well. Uh, and it's a case of um, always an open door policy in terms of seeking advice, whether that's for, my, for myself as group leader, on my interests and any issues that I have or issues of my group and I signpost regularly to Kelly. Uh, in terms of my relationship with other group leaders, um, I've had a fruitful relationship with Councillor Amanda Williams of the last term and this term as well, equally with uh, with Hugh. And I've known um, Councillor Spanswick for a long time as well. Um, he's uh, a couple of months into the role as group leader. and I, I very much hope that we can continue um, frank and transparent conversations so we can thrash any issues out um, in our monthly group leader meetings and very hopeful that, that can be the case. Thanks very much, Chair Dioch. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Um, so this would be the last chance for any other questions from the panel to any of the group leaders or on any topic specifically. Not seeing any hands. So um, I mean my take on this from that is there's definitely a discussion about social media and that sort of responsibility of group leaders to control what they can um, and obviously work has been done but it is a, an ever increasing battle I believe um, there's the training in terms of making sure that it's EDI um, friendly um, the town and community councils and more work that we need to do particularly in that area and also um, that reference to the code of conduct etc at the start of some of the group meetings and potentially uh, in any observations of town and community councils that's Few of the things that I drew out from the discussion is there. Um, again, referring to the meeting I attended of all chairs, um, the Ombudsman was there and did refer to the increasing number of cases that they are seeing. Um, and obviously some progress, some don't, but the impact on their workload is exponential over the last couple of years. Um, so trying to do that uh, in internal resolution, as a couple of referred to, beforehand and trying to stop them making it to that case um, but controlling some of these other things and continuing promoting standards will hopefully assist in that. So I'll draw that item to a close um, and uh, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. I believe a couple are moving at this, at this stage. Yeah, thank you Chair. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, Chair, thanks very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Chair, I'm going to pass over to Laura now. Um, I should have given my apologies at the start. We, you, we I did notify you previously. I, I have another meeting to attend at 10.30. So Laura is going to take over for the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Kelly. OK, so whizzing through to the next page. Let's write some on the agenda. Um, it's about the consultation responses following the independent review of the ethical standards framework. And hopefully I can pass over to Laura for an update on this. 
Um, thank you, Chair. Um, for the purposes of the recording, my name is Laura Griffiths and I'm the Group Manager of Legal and Democratic Services. Um, so this report is just um, for the committee's noting. Um, it's on the pen review and it's been some time since um, we last took a report um, on the pen review. Um, members will um, remember that it was a number of years ago um, now. Um, it was the then Minister for House, uh, Housing and Local Government. They commissioned what was known as the pen review. Um, Richard Penn was appointed and it was an independent review um, very much looking at the ethical standards framework. Um, the reasons for that is because the framework has remained largely unchanged over the last 20 years. Um, so it was felt very timely um, to review that. Um, so as the report indicated, um, indicates, the report was undertaken by Richard Penn. Um, the terms of the review are outlined in the report, um, just to remind members of that. Um, and then there is a link um, to the review that was undertaken back in 2021, if members want to remind themselves of that. Um, there were, um, as you can imagine, some recommendations that came out of that and a number of um, amendments. And since the publication of that review, um, there's been numerous engagement with monitoring officers, um, standards committees, um, the Public Services Ombudsman for Wales, Welsh Local Government Association. And that resulted in a consultation paper being published in March 2023. Um, we did take a report to standards at that time um, to notify members of the consultation that was taking place. Um, and it was agreed at that time that we would come back with the outcome of that consultation. Um, so that is attached at Appendix 1, Chair. Um, I don't intend to take members through it unless you, you wish me to, Chair. Um, all of the consultation report um, responses are within Appendix 1. Um, I think overall, um, you'll see there was broad support um, for the proposals. I think disappointing in terms of the amount of responses that they had via that consultation exercise. Um, but yes, as I've said, most of those have been um, um, supported. And it's very much just now to watch this space and we'll update the committee on anything that comes out as and when of that pen review. Um, so the recommendation then, Chair, is just for the committee to note the report. Thank you for that. I will take any questions if there are any. Can I just ask one in terms of, I may have missed it, but in terms of the, the timelines going forward, obviously it's, it's, it's all the recommendations. Is there a um, formal implementation plan or... No, Chair, interesting. The consultation report doesn't actually say anything about next steps in terms of implementation. And I did check um, to see whether there were further updates on the website um, and there's nothing as of yet. Um, so it's very much just going to be as and when it's progressed. And we will, of course, update the committee, um, you know, on anything that comes out of that. Thank you for that. OK, uh, I'm not seeing any hands, so um, no questions on that. So we move forward to the next item on the agenda, which is the annual report from Public Service Ombudsman uh, in terms of cases for um, um, Chair, so this is just our annual report of the Standards Committee. Um, so it's the annual report where we look back at 2023-2024. Um, and there is a requirement in legislation and our constitution that we provide an annual report. That's a new function coming up of the um, coming out of the Local Government and Elections Wales Act. There's now a legislative requirement for the Standards Committee to do an annual report. Um, and it's very much, as I've stipulated in the background, it's looking at how the committee um, discharges its functions, um, whether any reports have been taken um, to the Standards Committee, um, and then just very much um, an assessment of um, what we've had earlier on the agenda, looking at the duties of the leaders of the political groups, whether they've complied with their code of conduct duties and promoting those codes of conduct. Um, and then any recommendations that we think um, we should be making to council. Um, so the report is attached at um, Appendix A. Um, as we've indicated in the report, we will um, present it to full council um, 
in September, and that is just for noting, very similar to what we do for the Democratic Services Committee and scrutiny committees, they also have to provide um, an annual report. Um, so within that annual report at Appendix A, um, you will see, Chair, that we've got the membership of the committee, which obviously, obviously has changed um, since we've come um, to the time of reporting. Um, it um, sets out the role of the committee, which is um, set out in the Constitution. Um, we've indicated the recruitment exercise that um, we've had um, ongoing. Um, as the committee know, there is currently one vacancy on the committee due to the recent resignation of Mr. Sean Cullen. Um, and I can advise members that we did go out for advert um, during May. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have any expressions of interest. Um, so with the committee's um, approval, we'd be looking to run that recruitment exercise again in the autumn. Um, and hopefully we get some more interest. Um, it was disappointing. We did advertise that in local newspapers, but nothing came forward. Um, we've then got um, a section on monitoring compliance by leaders of the political groups, um, which is what we've um, looked at today, um, Chair. And then we've got um, code of conduct complaints. Um, this is information that has come directly from the PSOW annual report um, that they pre um, um, prepare. Um, you'll see there's a table. Um, we've also included for information town and community council code of conduct complaints for the year um, to give members um, a flavour of um, code of conduct complaints that have gone through the PSOW and whether they've been investigated or not. Um, just for members to note, because I think this was raised um, at a previous meeting, not all of the community councils are listed. So this will only be ones that have come to the attention of PSOW, um, but they are making plans to list all of the town and community councils of all councils moving forward. But at the moment, they only, um, they only publish the information of councils that have actually come to their attention. So that's why you won't see every town and community council listed. Um, and then we've touched upon dispensations, not something that we get very frequently on this committee, um, but it is just a reminder for members that there is an option to seek a dispensation via the standards committee um, if they've got um, a prejudicial interest. Um, and then very much looking ahead at the work that we propose that the committee do moving forward. Um, so unless there's any questions, Chair, it, it is just for the committee to note that report and to note that it will be going to full council in September. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, Councillor Williams, I'll come to you first. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I mean, Laura picked on it, but I picked it up last year. The table of town and community councils. I mean, it's, it's incorrect and I don't think it should be in there in that format. Uh, we, it, it's our report. Uh, it, it's the Ombudsman can't fix it in a year, then I think we should. And we, there are currently 20 town and community councils and there's, there should be 20 listed. And if it's, you know, there's, there's councils that are nothing and there's others that aren't there at all. So, so it should be corrected in my view before it goes to full council. Thank you. So if we come back up, if members, um, yes, if members are in agreement, I'm certainly happy to um, list all of, um, it has been lifted from the PSOW annual report um, but certainly happy to list all of um, the town and community councils so that there's a clear list um, going to full council. Um, but the stats are have come directly from PSOW in relation to what ones they've taken forward and what they've discontinued. But certainly happy Councillor Williams for us to add all of all of the 22. I'll take that away, certainly. I think that would be a, a good call based on showing that yes there are quite a lot of cases listed there but there obviously are some that there is no instances and um, so it just gives that more complete picture and balanced picture so thank you very much for that Councillor Williams. Gavin Thomas. Uh, thank you I, I agree with Councillor Williams I think it, it, it's a good thing to show that there are some good practices as well as some not not so well but uh, my question I guess was um, is this report going to be in the public domain uh, and my, my reason for the question that is um, some of the comments earlier about do town and community councils know so it's is it is this report going to be in the public domain and would it is it available to town and community council clerks um yes councillor thomas obviously the report has been published um it's on the website um so it is open to the public they can find all reports that are 
published for you know the standards committee agenda providing they're not exempt so it is an open report and it will be going to full council in september um, we can certainly um, bring it to the clerk's attention um, we can certainly do that um, but i think most of them are aware that there is now a requirement under the legislation for standards committees to produce an annual report um, so they should be aware that we do that um, but yes, we can certainly we can certainly bring it to the attention of all of the clerks so that they know that the annual report has gone. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Gavin. Um, any other questions, comments? No. Okay. Uh, so we move on to the next item, which is just for information, uh, which is just the update on current uh, status and. Complaints made against the Again, okay. there um, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so th this is just to update the committee because um, we have had a number of recent reports, as the committee know, that have were referred to the monitoring officer, um, and then they were considered by the standards committee. Um, we have had three recently. Members will be aware of those. Um, I don't intend um, to go through the background, Chair. Um, all I would say is that it, it's just there for the committee's noting. Um, it's not for the committee to revisit the decisions that were made by the committee at that time. And I should stress, as I've indicated in the report, that two of those cases listed, they are still in the appeals process appeal time frame. Um, so it would not be appropriate for us to discuss really any further in terms of those. Um, so it's just for noting. Um, yes, I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, I'll come to you, uh, Councillor Williams, um, being clear that this is for information, so um, not for unpicking, but I'll come to you for either a comment or a question if relevant. Thank you, Chair. And with that in mind, uh, I've certainly got no interest in, in delving back into, into these, particularly when um, when some are, are as you say and under potential appeal I, I i do have a an observation that there does seem to be an inconsistency in, in, in some of the sanctions we've applied um and I, not just over these three but perhaps when we go back to the, the one that was held just about 12 months ago as well and whether that's because of the change in in, in the committee makeup or whether that's because the panels for the three were quite chair different. i'm sorry i think i need to declare an interest at this point as i've declared an interest on at least two of the cases that have taken place in the last 12 months thank you sorry martin uh, my, my so, so my my question is how do we ensure uh that we are how do we satisfy ourselves that this committee is being consistent in our application of both sanctions and our understanding of of, of the cases um that come before us given that there are eight of us on the on, on the committee the panel could be three or four uh and and there is an in, apparent inconsistency there and i wonder what further training we could have as, as a committee to ensure that there is a a common approach and a common understanding and I did, as I, I was in common with Councillor Walter, I did declare prejudice interest in one of those and not take part, but this is after the fact. And it is, and it's really my observation that, that, that how do we ensure confidence that we have a, a common uh, understanding, a common approach, and, and parity across everything we do? And um, before I come up, uh, uh, Gavin, are you responding to that question directly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, if, if I may, Chair, so I, I've got a slightly different opinion to, to Councillor Williams. So uh, my view is, having just recently sat on at least one of these, is that um, we have to treat each case on its merits. So we have to be very careful about having predetermined sanctions for certain items because each case has different uh, nuances, different breaches, etc. I would say we, as part of our committee discussions, we are we are led and guided by the monitoring officer. Um, who certainly in the last case I dealt with raised previous cases and previous sanctions as a benchmark, um, but also the public service ombudsman suggests um, a level of what the sanctions should be. So I think the committee is guided by some external influences 
but I think we need to be mindful about having you, you, you can't necessarily compare two cases on a very high level um, title. You need to look into the actual breaches and the details. So I think it has to be on its merits rather than a, a standardized sanction. Um, Thank you, Karen. I, I accept. Mm -hmm. I, I accept that. I mean, I, and I'm not. I'm not for the, for the moment suggesting we should have almost like a, a predetermined book of sanctions. But um, perhaps in closed session, if we were to have um, some form of um, committee development or training where we could look back over what we've done, and collectively uh, come to a view of why we've determined or how we've determined, that would help help us going forward um, to we yes whilst we've got to completely we've got to take everything on its merits it would help us to be perhaps a more cohesive uh, standards committee in, in the months and years to come thank you i'll come to you laura yes right it was it was just to assist members um a number of years ago the um the all wales standards committee forum um, they did run a session specifically for members on hearings, um, on code of conduct hearings. Um, they haven't done that for some time, but it was certainly an agenda item and it was a session that members could go to um, as part of that standards committee conference, um, which is obviously open for all, all Wales standards committees. Um, I'm not sure when the next one is, um, is due, Chair. Um, because it, it's run by either South Wales or depending on whose turn it is next. Um, but that's certainly something that I'm happy to feed back via our All Wales Monitoring Officer group because they will want interest in terms of what people would like, what members would like to potentially see on the agenda. Um, so that's something that we can certainly feed back, Councillor Williams. Um, but I, I do recall a very good session on hearings um, because some members don't have experience. Some some standards committees have a considerable amount of hearings, some don't. Um, so it was a very useful training exercise. And I'm certainly happy to feed that back through the monitoring officer group to see if that's something that could go on the All Wales Standards Committee Forum. Um, but indeed, we could look for look at something for us as committee members too as well. Does that help, Councillor Williams? Yeah, yeah, I think it would. It would help greatly because it's not just for us. It's it's also, you know, I'm, we don't live in a bubble here. I, I, you know, we see comment out there, and, and how do you balance one breach versus another when they can be quite different? One could be technical in nature, the other could be, you know, quite grievous and offensive. How do you balance one against the other? And I think that's that's something we need to be clear on, and, and I think we need to be clear on it because if challenged in the streets or wherever we may be challenged, we we can we can um, we can robustly, you know defend our decisions. Thank you. Um, I would agree with that, Laura, in terms of, again, um, based on the All Wales Chairs Group, the number of cases and an increasing call on people to have hearings. Um, if that was able to be raised, that would be really useful. Um, I think there was a brief discussion about sanctions at that meeting, which, you know, long story, I was trying to catch a flight at the time. So I heard a little bit about that, but um, yeah, if we could take that back, that'd be great. So Gavin? Yeah, so I 100% agree that tra training for it, I think um, it, is, it was a really good, if we can get any training on that, because it is a new experience for a lot of people uh, and it is quite a, a technical process. I think that, that would be really beneficial. Uh, just a question, I guess, for yourself, Laura, is have the committee um, had any appeals against the sanctions that they've imposed? I, as I've indicated in the report, Councillor Thomas, one of the members has appealed to the APW and I don't have any further information in relation to that. Um, so it is now a matter for that to be considered by, um, sorry, I should say adjudication panel for Wales. It is now in the hands of the adjudication panel for Wales um, and no doubt they will report back um, to the monitoring officer and we can certainly report the same back then to the committee um with regard to the other case um i'm not aware if that has gone for an appeal but he is still within the time frames to appeal the decision so there was only one case listed in the report where the committee uh, sorry where the former member chose not to appeal um to apw but one for the other two yes one member has appealed 
and for the second I don't have any other further information um so at this stage it, it, it's in the hands of the APW okay thank, thank you for that thank you for that any other comments on that questions okay I think that brings us to the end of the formal agenda Yes, um, Chair, there's no, um, there's no urgent items, so that right. brings um, the business of the committee meeting to an end, Chair. Sorry. I've got uh, Roy's got his hand up, so I'll just come to Roy. Um, it's a sort of any other business sort of thing, but I don't know if it's appropriate. Uh, I'm not quite sure, really, but um, just following our discussions today, um, lots of us are new independent members, and some of the issues have come up. Um, regarding training of elected members. So I'm wondering if it's possible if we could receive a report to the Standards Committee regarding training provided by Democratic Services. Uh, I know little about the e-learning modules that is provided. I think that would be useful for us to know as well. Um, and also, I wasn't aware really of how the review system works that uh, uh, group leaders were undertaking. So it might be useful if we had an overview given to the Standards Committee. I think it's the overview overseen by, I think it was a Rachel Keefins I wrote down. So I, I think that might be useful for us as well. So I don't know if that's possible or, or this is the wrong wrong stage in the, in the meeting to be asking for those reports, but just going forward, just to improve our knowledge. So, okay, yeah. So if you if if you're happy for me to come back there, um, yes, um, the Democratic Services Committee they receive a regular report on the training that has been undertaken by members across um across the authority. That includes the mandatory training, really? also includes the e-learning training. So we do have a number of mandatory um e-learning training modules. For example, data protection is a mandatory one. Safeguarding, um, but democratic services will have a regular report that they have which shows the stats um what the position is of members and that also then um provides an outline of um the reviews um that you've mentioned roy and also the annual reports that um members have to submit um so i'm certainly happy um you know with the agreement of the committee we can put that on um the next agenda um for the committee we can i can take a very similar report that rachel our head of democratic services takes to her committee okay thank you thank you laura yeah. and councillor williams yeah just another uh aob that we're not really allowed to have but it, it, with regard to <laughs> training with regard to training i think I would personally, and I think the committee more generally would benefit from a really good session on declarations of interest. And I've pushed Kelly on this in, in the last normal, I think, standards committee back earlier in the year. Ultimately, ultimately when, when pushed about what, when should I declare interest, when not, it, it comes down to me. And that's not a comfortable place to be sometimes when you're a councillor. And, and I think we, I would welcome a really good session, whether it's just us with a lawyer. In, I know you are Laura, but someone else, we can really thrash some of these out. Just some are very obvious and some, you know, I declared it a personal interest today and Kelly said, is that prejudicial? No, it's not. I don't think, you see what I mean? And, and particularly when you have those protect, political protections where you have close relationships, I think I'd really like to explore that so we we really understand that if the answer is well there is no definitive answer maybe so but at least we've we've, we've gone through that that journey. Laura? Yes uh, thank you Councillor Williams um, I think that's, that that's something that all members um, would find beneficial not just members um, of this committee um, so what I'll propose is I'll um, I'll make that recommendation to um, our head of democratic services and she can feed that into the training report that goes to yeah. democratic services uh, where they look at future training that they think it would be beneficial um, to all members um, so we'll certainly look to include that one specifically on interests um, and we can open that training up then chair to members of this um, committee as well thank you laura thank you be quiet. 
Um, my last observation, not on any other business, um, we mentioned quite a bit town and community councils today, and I know we've, we've had a, a program of trying to sort of go and do some observations. It would just be useful to have an update of which councils have been had a, a member visit. Um, I appreciate it's been a pretty busy time for members over the last few months with um, hearings and other engagements. So, um, but obviously, I think that's something. I think it's on your work program for next year that we want to continue that work. Um, but just a list of who's already been visited and those yeah. that um, yeah, definitely we can prioritise some time. Some holidays might not be ideal. I'm not sure yeah. over the next three or four months. Yes, Jeff, we um we had um a table and we can I, I can pull that together with dates of relevant um meetings and timings um if members would like to observe and then it would be matter um, I'm happy for members then to link in with me and I can link in with the relevant clerk of the meeting as a matter of courtesy um to notify them that um one of our members will be observing. All clerks are aware of that. Mm -hmm. And um but just to get the details whether you know the how the meeting is going to be held to get you the relevant link or whatever so i'll certainly look to circulate that again to all members the dates of upcoming meetings and then you can let me know and i can tell you all yeah, who would like to attend which one yeah that's fine and yeah identifying those that have already been picked off so to speak and i think i'm not sure whether if my memory serves me right at the start of that meeting just some wording for members to be able to sort of say why they're coming yeah. and going back on some of the earlier conversations about the code of conduct, increasing cases yeah, and yeah. Sort of that support network, just reiterating that in terms of what the code of conduct's about in that messaging, I think might be useful just a standard approach for all members when we are attending. Um, I'll come to Gavin Thomas. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a really good thing. Uh, and on the list of where 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 the standards committee have been is a good thing. Um, secondly, given the Ombudsman's report and the, uh, is it a, a case of prioritising some of the councils that are potentially in, um, had complaints against them, mm. rather than the committee just visiting um, yes. councils that haven't had complaints? So may, maybe it's an opportunity to prioritise the visits based on a number of Ombudsman's complaints. I think it's a balance of, of that and also people's availability in the meeting. So yes, I think between those two, uh, there's definitely some uh, that are more, more prolific uh, in some instances. Um, I think we have, is it Peter? I saw a hand go down, but I think Peter, your hand is up. Yeah, apologies, my uh, camera's not working. Um, but following on from what you've just said, um, Laura, would you be able to forward, particularly myself and Phil, the, um, the meeting dates for post call town council please because i think that was when the action points from the latest hearing so that'd be great yes certainly i'll do that thank you right. i think that's it i think peter i think we're doing all the hand up and we still got it oh philip clark sorry yeah Jen. someone's still on uh, Roy, can you just go on mute for a minute? Oh. And then you want to on mute. Mm. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, confirm what Peter had just said is that we agreed that we would do these independent meetings, but to, but to be effective, we need to actually coordinate it rather than just pick up off a, off a list. So some form of coordination will help to achieve a better result. I agree. So, uh, how do we want to do that? So, any suggestions? Gavin? Um, for want of a better word, is, is it possible to get a, a list of all of the the, the, the dates because I think most town councils meet once a month on a recurring a recurring date so if we could get a list of what they all are then I guess we could create some sort of a rota for want of a better word where um, if, if that's circulated to the standards committee people can just grab slots on it so at least we will and then everybody can have visibility of that and, and maybe it's worth reviewing that in the next standards meeting to say these are the ones have, who've attended which ones yeah 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 Happy with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm keen to, to 
not have any more any of the business but I think they were really important items so if there's nothing else from anyone else um we'll close the meeting and uh, uh stop the recording as well thank you thank you very much for your time today and I think our next meeting is